Hello and welcome to another episode of the DJ Project Criterion Collection. And here we're going to talk about Spine 422, The Last Emperor, directed by Bernardo Bertolucci, 1987. It's very appropriate that I'm talking about this film considering what happened this past weekend. So, let's talk about the Oscars! Um, before I get into that, I'd like to point out that so far with uh, the Criterion Collection, and I'm just talking about the DVDs and Blu-rays, I know the Laserdiscs, the list is a little bit longer, <clears throat> but um, on the DVDs and Blu-rays, including the out-of-print titles, there have been f there are five titles that have won Best Picture that are on the Criterion Collection. And they are uh, Hamlet, 1948, Lawrence Olivier, On the Waterfront, which is more recent, which actually just came out <clears throat> uh, last week or a couple weeks ago. Uh, Rebecca, it's out of print. Uh, Silence of the Lambs, also out of print. And finally, this one. Um, and actually, I remember, I actually got a earlier copy of it. This was when I was first starting to get DVDs. And I think it was one of those part curiosity and... I mean, I, I knew of the film, and I probably saw some scenes of it, like, <clears throat> my parents were watching it, and I happened to be in the room for a spell, and they were watching it at the time or something, but and it was one of those early pickups that I got that I thought, oh, this is a good film to get. And this also kind of taught me how to be patient with my uh, DVD, view, uh, DVD acquisitions, um, so... Um, I thought it was okay at the time, uh, but I was anticipating something better, which um, um, there's one little aspect that I'll cover a little bit later on. So anyway, so that's so this is a film that I've known for quite a while. Though interestingly, it was a different version. The initial, uh, this is the, I think it came out in 1990, I want to say 1999, maybe 2000, but it was, it was released through Artisan Entertainment. Uh, the the version that's that was on there was was touted by them as the director's cut. Um, the assumption being that directors always want their films to be as long as possible, than rather than as short as possible, uh, which actually was very very misleading, because um, what actually the version that I saw was a television version. Uh, the story was is that one of the financiers of the film, or one of the, or one of the people who got involved in the in the film production, uh, one of their uh, contract mandates was to have a version that they could then show on television. So, what they actually gave them was kind of a rough cut. It, it's it's sort of the closest you get to sort of a rough cut, um, but. Bertolucci was not really particularly interested in it, and he knew that he was going to get a much better version working with, uh, working with his editor, and they did, and, and so they released it in the theaters, and that was the version that won all the, that did, a, did an Oscar sweep <clears throat> that year, including Best Picture, and it was a very surprising sweep, too, because it didn't have a, a great big um, box office... Uh, return in the first couple of weeks. It was only about by word of mouth and then finally became this big thing before it was actually nominated and then it became the surprise sweep. So um, so actually it seemed that so I, I, I knew it in its longer version and in just revisiting it I just I just kept it to the theatrical cut. In fact I watched this right after going through Berlin Alexanderplatz. Because of Berlin Alexanderplatz, it, it kind of um, screwed up the way that I view it. I try to view them in spine order, just in keeping with the episodes. Um, but because I knew that Berlin Alexanderplatz was going to be a major investment in time, I wanted to be very efficient in my viewing. So I rearranged some of the titles as far as viewing. I did the more shorter titles first, then Berlin, or Alexander, then Berlin Alexanderplatz. And then I considered um, The Last Emperor as, okay, this is going to be like an easy breeze because I'm very familiar with the film. I know the film, and so it, it gives my brain a little bit of a rest after 
going through 15 and a half hours of Berlin Alexanderplatz. So, um, but I, I, I kept to the theatrical cut because that, that's actually what Bertolucci prefers. That would be his director's cut, not, not, this, not the longer one. And it's very easy to see why. A lot of this, a lot of what's, what's uh, the difference between the two, the theatrical version, you could tell that it, it, it's, you know, it, it works very well for the theater. Um, the, the scenes sort of snap, there's, there's, a, there's an energy to it, it there's, there's, a, there's a nice steady momentum. Although I will say that the television, the television version, because it was kind of a rougher cut, um, you feel like the scenes have a little bit of breathing room. You feel like it, it has it, it plays a little bit more naturally. But I think this was not something that Bertolucci was interested in. He was interested more in 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 pace and, and having the the energy just to just to keep yourself going. And so, um, and. And there are certain lines that I remember from the, the television version that are not there in the theatrical version, but I could see why it was not there. So it's, it's a nice little study of contrast. And, and, and I'm <laughs> so actually going back to, I, I, know, I know about my little Bergman rant uh, about the differences between the television and the theatrical. Um, this was a case where it was actually the reverse for me, where I, I knew the television edit, uh, the television version more than I knew the theatrical version. And I would say that, that, that both have their advantages, certainly, but I would say that I would probably lean more closer to the theatrical cut, um, as this was preferred by Bertolucci, this was refined, um, you get a better sense, you know, it's, the, the editing is a little bit better and tighter and, and, and everything, it just flows a bit better. So, continuing on with the Oscar thing, seeing this film, I can't help but think that this, this is what Oscar bait is about. <laughs> now, I'm not saying, I am not saying that this was designed to win the Oscars. In fact, as I said before, it, it had a, it, it was a very, uh, it was one of those unusual wins. It was one of those unexpected wins uh, for the for the Best Picture Oscar. And yeah, it can be like every year. It's always disputed about who gets Best Picture. It's like, do they? You know, does that does that film really deserve Best Picture? Or all right, very since I'm not since I'm not going to talk about this ever, probably ever again. I'll say this about the Oscars. Those of you who know me will will, will know this. This is my opinion of. The Academy Awards. Number one, this is, it's a, what the Academy Awards are, it's an industry that awards itself. That's what the Academy is. The Academy, they're, they're all members who work in the industry and they vote amongst themselves about what is the best achievements in certain categories and then finally what is considered the best picture. So it is an industry that it's voting for itself. And so all the implications that go with it. So keep that in mind. It's, 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 not like, it's not like winning an award at a film festival or winning um, a, um, a critics award or, or any of that sort. I mean, this, this is the industry voting for itself. It's awarding itself. And then finally, this is the closest that cinephiles get to acting like everybody else does during a playoff season where there's all these there's all these you know intense emotions and you're rooting for films and it's like and then you go wow it's so great that this won or how dare that this film won and and again it's it's the closest that cinephiles get to acting like um, like what everybody else will do certainly next month with the NCAA basketball tournament um, or like any other time where there's a playoff season where you have your, you know, you have your, you have your charts and you, you, you have your, uh, you have your champion trees and your charts and everything and you go like, okay, who's going to win and such. And so the Oscars are like that for cinephiles. <laughs> That's really it. So I, I try, I mean, in some sense it's exciting and yes, it, it can be great when when something is won but at the same time i also know that it's 
it's so heavy with politics and not just the obvious politics, but just the, the whole, like, giving an award as a sympathy or giving the award more as, as a career thing rather than that specific performance. I know all of that. I've seen that all played. And, and really the bottom line should be, do you like the film? <laughs> do, you, does, do you like the performances? Do you like the technical achievement? That's really what should matter. The award doesn't really make a difference. I don't see the I don't see the award being a essential condition to whether something is good or not, either in its either in its totality or in its individual parts. Um, you know, I I don't think the award because there are plenty of films that that have been given all these accolades and you don't really talk about all that much. And likewise, there are, there are films that are famous for being neglected and scorned and vilified, but they end up becoming something. So it's really not the, it's, it's, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't put this, um, the Oscars are fun, but don't put your trust in the Academy, <laughs> is all I'm saying. All right, now that we got that out of the way, um, back to the whole Oscar bait thing. Um, I don't think this was, now... As I said before, I don't think this was intentionally designed to win an Academy Awards, but it just seems to have everything that you expect an Oscar, a Best Picture Oscar to have. Um, there's, you know, there, there's uh, great cinematography. There's there's a there's a lavish and um, very detailed production design. The story is very epic. The setting is exotic. Um, there's a there's a few named actors in it, and it's just like everything is just about scope and grandeur. And it's very romantic, and it's and it's and it's emotional, and it and it, play, and it plays on yeah, it plays on emotion and 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 all those things. It just it, it just has <laughs> again. It's, it's it's sort of it's one of the pictures. I mean, there's there's plenty of other pictures that I think of as, as Oscar bait, but this is certainly one of them um, that just. <laughs> fulfills it very well. Now, it makes it sound like I'm disparaging the film where that the film, usually when you say Oscar bait, it's usually that, oh, you can just, you can smell the award attempts, and, but there's not really that much of value. Well, that's not necessarily true. I mean, it is limited. It's not perfect. Um, I mean, the okay, The Last Emperor, in a nutshell, this, this follows the... Uh, Basically, the life of uh, uh, Henry Puyi, who was the the last crown emperor of China, and actually it works as a as a cross cut narrative in the tradition of Godfather Part Two, another Best Picture Oscar winner, um, where the main the main story is actually him um, in prison uh, in uh, in Red China. Uh, answering for war crimes while he was a puppet, uh, or while he was the emperor of Manchukuo, the uh, the the Japanese uh, um, the the Japanese rendering of Manchuria, you know, after the after the 1931 invasion of Manchuria, then a puppet site was set, and he was basically set up as a puppet emperor. So he he's he's going into prison to answer for that and to be rehabilitated and, and reintroduced into the uh, the new People's Republic of China. And it crosscuts with flashbacks about his, uh, his earlier life, beginning when he was uh, called forth to be in the, in the Forbidden City by the uh, Empress Dowager um, at the young age of three or so. Called there and then suddenly he gets Suddenly he gets crowned. He becomes emperor. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> How's that? Your, your life starts at three. You know, usually, usually, um, usually people tell you that your life starts later. But nope. <laughs> he gets crowned emperor at three. Uh, it ends up being the last time that you have this kind of coordination. And um, so, and then it goes through that. It's And obviously, um, China was going through a big... <laughs> Uh, very quick and dirty turmoil period, um, and anybody who knows anything about Chinese history, this it's it's 
turmoils are plenty, but they, they tend to be pretty like long stretches. But this is but it's it's amazing when you look at China in the twentieth century, what has happened to it as a nation. It it went from basically ending uh, not just not just a particular dynasty, not just not just the Qing King dynasty, Qing dynasty, sorry, um, but also um, ending the more or less the traditional long-standing um, imperial system, where, where there's where the emperor ruled China. They went they completely, pretty much completely, they pretty much jettisoned the whole thing, and they went straight on into a republic, which went through various incarnations. Then World War II happened. Then, um, then Mao came in, and then now China is, is kind of in this sort of weird hybrid situation. But, um, but paradoxically, it still remains China, even though it's, it's changed its governance. It's, it still retains its character. And that's, to me, is what's fascinating about China, is, is we tend to... Because of because of its history, and particularly in the twentieth century, and even a little bit before into the going in, a little bit into the nineteenth century, because of the interaction with the West, it's very easy to <clears throat> think of the West being imposed onto China. But I I like to say that I like to think of it as China kind of using, you know, obviously being influenced by the West, but kind of doing at the same time its own thing. Um, like when it when it embraced communism. I mean, the only time that it really fully embraced communism is when Mao really went head on, full on with um, the 1967 uh, Cultural Revolution. Um, is is when he really got extreme. But then even then, it was it was like, dude, you're going really too far. Um, while there is a there is a a communist justification what China does, it a lot of it is still very traditional. It's it's just a uh, it's still rooted in in Confucianism. It still run. It still runs through the culture. It's just now you have all these other modern elements sort of thrown into it. But anyways, I digress. <laughs> so that's what the entire film kind of covers is is sort of his life, both um, flashbacks of of his life up to when he was um, when he was when he was in this Chinese prison, and then his going through the through the Chinese prison, and then um, finally ending up uh, working as a simple gardener for the remaining years of his life, and then finally dying, uh, and finally he died in 1967. So, anyways, that's what the whole film covers. <clears throat> um, so it's, okay, so it's not, um, I haven't dug too, too deeply in this. I think there may have been some historical... I'm sure there was some some slight historical liberties. I know there's been some errors as far as the, the facts and what what people have said as far as the timeline of things, and there's some slight anachronisms and, and so forth. But at the same time, I also don't pretend to, to see this as a historically authentic film. Because I don't think that's really what the interest was for everybody involved in it. I think it was more um, about the a kind of once, once not just a once in a lifetime, but pretty much a once in a millennium situation where you have someone in a great position. Then it, it's it's um I, I've seen I've heard it said that it's an epic in reverse where. Instead of having a lowly guy rising up, you have a guy who's already in a great position of power who is then lowered. And for China, I mean, for China, um, China believed it when when you had an emperor, it was it he was considered divine. Um, that that concept was was very very strong and very very prevalent. So, and again, he was he was. Uh, he was he ascended into the throne at the age of three. So imagine the psychological effect <laughs> of being told at the age of three that you are essentially a god. You are you are divine. You are the Lord of ten thousand years. You are the Son of Heaven. To have that, I mean, it's it's and then to go through that and then to grow up in the midst of this. Um, 
this constant political change and upheaval where your very where your very position has has changed greatly in a big way not just not just oh, oh it's a new dynasty i mean you are no longer considered the absolute rule of china we're now we're now taking matters into our own hands we're now going to we're going to have to do more a democratic rule, republic rule. So it's no longer the emperor that's calling the shots. So to have that change will also have an effect. Then you have um, World War II, and then the prospect of being emperor again, but then it turns out not to be exactly what you thought it would be. Uh, you're, you're now, you're somebody else, you're basically somebody else's bitch, really. It's, it's not that you're, you are, your own man. It's it's not like you're truly emperor. You're 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 just you're just a puppet. And then to go from that, and then to go through this process where you are reacclimated into this new China that's that's even more different than what how you grew up. And finally, you you end up being a gardener. I mean, that progression is just really really fascinating. And that's and actually that's what makes the film really fascinating is to see that that psychological story played out um, where this where you basically go from emperor to gardener and it's really quite interesting uh, to, to look at and and then by a certain extension I it's it's a personal epic and I find that I I, I tend to like those epic films I mean usually the ep when someone calls a film an, an epic film it's 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 about grandeur. It's about a big wide scope. It's about sweeping vistas. It's it's getting the large sense of history. And sometimes it, you can pull it off. But I find that the the epics that work are the ones that have that kind of grandeur, but they still feel very human. You can still go along the story. This is why I like Braveheart. It it's there's the yes there's liberties taken with the history, but it feels very personal. It's 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 a it's, a, it's an approachable story. Um, I don't feel the same way with Spartacus, where yes, it's yes, it's definitely an epic film, but um, very few of the characters feel very human. I mean, the the title character is doesn't come off to me as, as very human. He, he's not. I don't see a lot of his flaws, um, um, but. But the Last Emperor is a, is like a personal epic. It's 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 this one man in in going through um, a an exciting, a turbulent, an uncertain, and just a incredible period, you know, of, of sixty years of of where China was was. I mean, China is famous for having going from one phase to the next in, in very dramatic ways, but the dramatic changes that happened in the 20th century are, were very, were, happened very fast and they were very dramatic, but it all happened in a short amount of time. Instead of waiting for about 500 years or so, or 700 years to go from one phase to the next, I mean, all of that was happening within the span of a few decades rather than in a few centuries. So it was, it was really, it's really quite fascinating to see. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably the biggest takeaway from the film. And, and again, it's, it's, um, it's kind of everything you expect with an Oscar film. It's, you know, it's, it's very, you know, rich and, and, and I mentioned the cinematography, um, which then leads into the other thing, as I said earlier about earlier DVE releases. Okay, this, all right, Criterion has the reputation. Part of, part of what makes their reputation is that, they show off films that are, um, it's, it's the director approved, director approved label. Um, whenever they can, they like to get the directors of the films involved in, in the presentation to make sure that it looks exactly the way that they want it to, that it's <clears throat> presented in the right way, that there's the right kind of supplements that help bolster it. And, um, um, this is one of those very, very somewhat contentious cases, and when it came out of the time, and okay, <clears throat> um, 
Cin the film cinematographer Victorio uh, Sotaro, um, so, uh, sorry, uh, Storato, uh, was involved with the transfer. He both supervised and approved the uh, transfer, uh, going from film into into a digital format. He was the telecine, telecine supervisor, is, is, is what is it is. Now, Storato is was around this time, and even starting a little bit, st starting earlier, he was fascinated with this particular aspect ratio. Again, aspect ratio is the relationship of an image's width to its height. Um, so the, st the televisions that I grew up with were square, and the ratio is 1.33 to 1. Um, Cinemascope is uh, 2.35 to 1. And then there's then there's and then there's some widescreen ratios in between. Now, Storaro was had it in his head to um, compose his shots using a two to one aspect ratio. So so literally, it's an image that's twice as wide as it is high. And he also now he started. I think starting in 1998, he started to really think about composing it. But then he also started making claims that he had always intended the films that he shot to be at that aspect ratio. Which means that, uh, okay, this gets into the, basically what, what happens is, is that he, he, um, he ends up cropping the image. And the justification he has for it is a little bit suspect. The reason why he feels that he wants to do it in this aspect ratio is that he wanted uh, a middle ground between um, the the wideness of of shooting it in in something like CinemaScope or the or the anamorphic widescreen ratio 2.35 to one. Um, he wanted he wanted to preserve some of that, but also have it be to take advantage of the resolution in televisions. And so you'll be a, so why not meet somewhere in the middle and do this two to one aspect ratio. Which means in order to do that, you have to um, zoom in slightly, and then you have to crop the left and the right sides. Now, I, and I know a lot of, I know a lot of other um, people who are aware of the, fan, uh, aware of the film, um, are not the biggest fans of this recropping. Uh, he did this with this film. He also famously did this with Apocalypse Now, which he also was the cinematographer for. And, um, and that was really controversial with uh, the DVD release. Um, it's, for the Blu-ray, it's actually, it's actually presented in the 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio. And, and it's for that reason why I'm, I definitely want to get Apocalypse Now on Blu-ray, even though I don't, as of yet, have a Blu-ray player myself. But... For this one, I'm stuck with the two to one aspect ratio. Now, why am I spending all this time talking about this? Well, I do notice a, a, a compositional difference. When you, when you recrop it, you, you, again, you're, you're losing information on the left and right. And I think it, it destroys a bit of some of the symmetry of the shots. And I think probably the most obvious example is there's, there's, a, there's a scene where Pui as He's supposed to be about, I say about seven or eight. the The timeline gets a little bit fuzzy in, in, the, in the first part of his life, but he's around like seven or eight years old, and his uh, younger brother is visiting him, and he's he's um, you know, he's being carried on a chair, and he's telling him he's like, oh, beating the emperor is really great, and and he wants to, and the brother's like, oh, we we play games together, and, and the emperor goes, I I know a game, and he starts running, and then his his entourage starts following him, and then they they run into um, uh, I forget what that large square is in the Forbidden City. And yes, that's the other the other memorable trait with the Last Emperor is that this was the first feature film um, from a Western production that was able to film in the Forbidden City. Uh, the the Chinese government actually gave permission. Uh, for for that production to be filmed there, and the other famous anecdote was uh, Queen Elizabeth II uh, was um, 
was doing a state visit at the time and actually the production had priority over <laughs> the state visit, which means Elizabeth II, uh, Her Majesty could not visit the <laughs> Forbidden City <laughs> while they were filming it because they, they had precedence. But anyways, <clears throat> so anyway, so they're this this big square and you, and you and you see the and you see the I want to say it's called the Temple of Heaven, uh, but it's it's the it's what's memorable about the Forbidden City in Beijing. It's usually when you say Beijing, you usually think of this this particular palace, and they're the two of them are running, and then the entourage follows them. But what is it happening is that they they form an oval, they form this circle, and I remember in the earlier release, which was which was presented in a 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio. It may have been like 2.4, so it may, may have been slightly more wider uh, than that. But I remember that oval, it just, it was so perfect. It, it fit exactly within the frame. You can see that and it's just, everything just looked, it looked balanced. It, it was, it was a great, it was one of those great cinematic shots. You're like, mm, that's just, that's just, it's, it's the kind of thing that it's the kind of shot that makes you want to make your own films. It's like I want to make a shot like that. I want to, I want to, I want to make a shot that's that's that well composed. You lose a bit of that in in the in the two, uh, in the two to one, aspect ratio uh, because again you're you're cropping it, and so the oval is not as 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 there. There's there's some of it that gets cropped off. Another really telling cropped moment is when, much later on in the film, where. Um, Henry and his uh, two wives, he's now no longer the emperor, but he's living in uh, Tain Sing, and he's about to be, you know, he's, he's getting more and more seduced by the Japanese, and they start to pull him into Manchuria, and, and they eventually help set him up to be the, the emperor of, of Manchu Kuo. But anyways, but there's, they're in this car, and, and they're, they're sitting in the back seat, and there's a not in the f very first shot, but, they, but in this other shot where the cuts cuts to them, and like half of his face is cut off. He's he's in the he's in the right of frame, and about half of his face is cut off, which I assume was not the case if you show it full. So um, now the reason why I bring up all of this is because he claimed that he always intended um, that film to be shown at, at two to one. And I call bullshit on that one. Um, if you, the, the good cinematographers, if there is a particular aspect ratio you have in mind, you will compose with that aspect ratio in mind. And if you have one, and if it's one that's not conventional or one that is not normally shown, usually what you do is you end up shooting for multiple aspect ratios. Uh, Stanley Kubrick was was a master at this. He would he loved shooting open frame, which means he wanted to expose the full negative, so it's one point three three to one. But he also anticipated that it would be um, matted for theatrical projection. So he wanted the image to look good both as a full frame because, and also this is a carryover of, his, of him being a photographer, so he was used to working in that aspect ratio. He wanted to look good then, but he also wanted it to look good for the theaters. So he would, you know, mark it off somehow on his head so that it would work within that frame. So it would work in both. Um, I mean, that's that's one very famous example, but I don't see any really evidence of, of him anticipating for that. And probably the, the, probably the most telling, uh, I think the, probably the, the, the big thing that kind of refutiates his claim that um, this was intentionally composed in that aspect ratio was um, in the, one of the supplement features is a behind the scenes uh, sort of look at the, uh, the, <laughs> the production. And at the monitor, there's no indication on the monitor uh, of marked lines of knowing where, where the crop is going to happen. And I would I would imagine that there would probably be some there would be be some uh, masking tape on the left and right that would that would show what the the two to one aspect ratio was. So I think it was I think it was always meant to be. I think this is this is pure revisionism. This is something that he is currently a, a fan of and that he wants to go back and 
redo the films that he has made. And the reason why the, the reason why I've spent a considerable portion of time talking about this is because this is an example of of letting something go and not constantly tinkering with it. And because um, again, this this was a film that was noted for cinematography. In fact, that's one of the Oscars it won for. It won for Best Cinematography. And to do this revisionist thing is to really not do the film justice. And especially if it if it worked beautifully in that aspect ratio, 2.35 to 1. And in fact, for the 70 millimeter prints, it uses a different, it has a slightly different aspect ratio. It's 2.2, it's 2.2 to 1 and it also worked great, then why not, why mess around? Why fudge it for a very, um, a very suspicious reason? Because you want to, you want to, you know, you want to have it work for television resolution? I mean, who's to say that the television presentation gets better? And I think we, we've, we've, we've gotten to a point where it, it has, where the issues that Strader raised at the time that he was advocating for this, I think was no longer a major issue or was no longer a big concern. So it's almost like, what's the point of doing this? You're just doing this because you want to, you want to tinker with it. So why mess around with, with art? So all of that being said, um, if you haven't seen this, go see it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure you, you probably have had, episodes where you went, you know, I want to see, I want to see the best picture Oscar. So it'll definitely be on that list. Um, and I, I think it, it is, um, I've, I have to relook at what, who the nominees were for best picture that year, but, um, maybe there's some other ones that would, would have been considered better, but nonetheless, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a very, uh, it's, it's, it's a very worthy win, uh, especially again, since this was the first, uh, feature film of, from a Western production to be able to film in Forbidden City. Um, it looks great, aspect ratios aside. Um, and it's, um, again, it's, it's a personal epic. It's an epic in reverse. It's, it's interesting to look at the, the human quality of it. Um, and I'll say this really quick thing about the culture aspect. I'm not going to pretend to know everything about Chinese culture. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not versed in it. I'm not knowledgeable about it, so I'm not going to say anything that's that I'm not familiar with. But I get the suspicion that what makes this really fascinating is the layers of it. There's there's the way, there's the Chinese mindset, then there's the Western mindset, and then there's everybody else. And it's just all this, there there is a kind of, I, I anticipate that there's an interesting little interaction at, at play between these different worlds, and that's also what makes it interesting. And considering that this was a moment when a lot of paradigms and a lot of things were, were being shifted and shuffled around uh, at various points. It's, it's interesting to see how that plays out. And then also, again, the more things change, the more they remain the same. So uh, if you haven't seen this, I would say check it out. Uh, <laughs> uh, I know it doesn't sound like the most enthusiastic response, but probably because I've seen a lot of other films uh, that I probably like more than The Last Emperor. But, um, but nonetheless, it's... It's very enjoyable, and and it's it goes by really fast. Certainly compared to after seeing <laughs> Berlin Alexander Plaza, it definitely goes by a little bit fast. But um, but yeah, if you haven't seen it, check it out. The Last Emperor, and until next time, take care.